All right, you should be all set. Okay, it is 403 on July 11, 2023. Oh, we need to wait to select board to order item number one. Minutes of the meeting of June 14th. Oh, sorry, uh, June 27th. Any no comments? comments? No comments. There, there was a late revision that was sent around. Did you get that? Yes. Okay. Yes, I did. Uh, I will move to the minutes. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, then payroll warrants. Any questions, comments? None. None. Public comment. Okay. Wait a moment. Hello. Uh, okay. Do we have anyone from the public who will comment on anything not on the agenda? No. Next, we have no scheduled appointments. We have no new COVID information aside from the rapid test still available at town office. It's old business. Next steps towards replacement of the highway brush. Brian, you want to go into that? Um. Yeah, um, so Keith, um, Fred and myself have been meeting to talk about what we think our next steps to move forward. Um, we were, uh, we did some research on the designer selection process. We did some research on um, whether there would be any benefit to using uh, modular pre-engineered buildings and how that would impact, um, you know, how we initially start with the design of, of um, the project. Um, so the designer selection law says that, um, well, we need to follow the designer selection law. If the project, if the design costs are exceed $30,000, um, or is it a million? I think the project costs I more than one, one, and half. Bob, one and a half. One and a half. If the, so it's four, right? If design, the design costs exceed $30,000 or, um, the construction costs exceed 1.5 million. We'd have to use the desired selection law to do new construction of a municipal building. Um, so if either of those are not met, then you don't have we don't have to use the designer selection law. Designer selection law is a it's a qualification based process where uh, we did this for the uh, the town hall renovations. We have to um, we have to go out um, essentially to bid for a designer for an architect. Um, and it's a qualifications based process. So it's separate. Well, we choose the designer based on qualifications that are submitted, and then we negotiate price. Um, and then if so, that would be to get our designer. If I can step back for one second, if we think the total construction cost is going to be over 1.5 million, which may or may not be, before we do the designer selection process, we would need to hire an OPM, an owner's project manager. And that's that same qualifications based process um, where we would put out a, a request for uh, qualifications. Um, we would receive proposals back. We would select somebody based on qualifications and we would negotiate price. So it's the way it's set up is we really have to do it twice to get an OPM and then an actual designer for the project. So if if we don't have to go through that design process or we have or we can go for a less expensive design process. Um, you know, there might be some cost savings up front. Mm -hmm. um, and there also seems to be some cost savings if we were to go with some type of pre-engineered structure, um, but we don't know that for sure. I know Fred had done some research sort of specking out what those costs would be in terms of just like the outer shell. Um, and I, those were around a couple hundred thousand. Yeah, some, somewhere around a couple hundred thousand. For the shell, no electrical, no groundwork, right. no plumbing. Um, so, if, if you recall, we uh, we meeting uh, Fred, Keith, and myself met with um, uh, somebody from Weston and Sampson, an engineering and architect firm. Um, that's um, in West. Well, I know they're all around mm -hmm. Mass, but they're in Western Mass. And then we met with we met via Zoom with. Um, uh, representatives from KT, yeah. KT Architects, and they were out closer to Boston. Um, and Weston and Sampson submitted a proposal, and and that's what's included in the packet about 
Um, when we talked about it, it was more talked about like a programming study. So one of the questions that we always kick around is, well, what does the highway department actually need mm -hmm. um, from, from an operation standpoint? And it's, it, and I'll speak for myself and, and Fred and Keith can jump in, but it, it seems to me that's sort of a threshold question of, well, before we design the building, we really need to know what we need. Um, so, and, and, and where it might go. And, and where it might go. Um, but obviously, you know, once we once we figure out what's what we need, I know that's sort of, that's a vague concept. But then we could figure out also, you know, right. where it fits. Um, and when we met with Kate, the architects, they were pushing us towards the <laughs> selection process. They didn't set up. They didn't send us a proposal. They wanted to jump into the. They suggested that we just go right out to the. Uh, the qualifications based process to, to bring on a designer mm -hmm. and that study that programming study would be part of you know part of that um so that's kind of where we're i mean that's where we're at right now in terms of um our thinking so i'll let fred and Kate yeah um, i'm sort of thinking that going with western samson is sort of like getting a preliminary guide to the process and you know, just starting to work through it, whether we end up hiring them later for some other part of it, I've got no idea, but I think we need someone who's familiar with how these things are done and what the rough costs might be, and in just plotting out, as Brian said, what we need. Um, we just don't have the collective experience here to, to constructing buildings from the ground up. Um, the, the proposed cost, the estimate they gave us is $24,500. We've got money in the building stabilization fund, which has been getting put away for a couple of years now. And that's around 125000 in that account. And the, the idea of that was not that that money would be, ever be enough to build a building, but that that is seed money to fund studies like this and hire people like this to get the project going. And I think it's also important that we get it moving to a point that if state or federal monies for municipal buildings open up in the next year, two or three, we've got a project that's ready to go that we can submit quickly with plans. Maybe the plans need to be revised at the end of the process, but we won't be starting from scratch if that money comes available. So that's why we're looking at doing this now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Keith, do you have any? Yeah, I, I pretty much agree with everything that's been said. You know, where I come from and where I'm, my standpoint is we definitely need someone who can come in and help us with the square footage. I can tell you based on what I feel my needs are, I'll just make an example of the, 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 field, the, the room that might have the, the HVAC system in it. I may say, I, I think it could be done in 150 square feet. Building code might say you've got to have 500 square feet because it's got to be this far away from this and that. That's where I, I don't know what the building, where the building code is going to rearrange and make and adjust the square footage and make it bigger than what I think we can get by with. And that's what we really need. Other things here, you know, like the wash base and things like that, when a company that deals with us every, on a daily basis can sit down with us and help us devise our real square footage that we need. And, and also have an idea of the technologies available that for doing some of these functions that we may not even be aware of, you know, of, you know, like a wash bay, there may be ways to do, you know, one way or do it cheaper or better another way. You know, we have built a building like this with a wash bay, so. Well, I mean, yeah, I know we're like going to have a wash bay. That's not, right. that's, that's. But that, that, that's just an example. There are other elements of the building that, um, you know, may be possibilities and. You could have someone with experience sort of help, help us work through the process. 
Okay. And, uh, and that's why I think we're on the right page here that we get the ball rolling. Uh, I mean, every year you put this off, and when you take into consideration, you know, a project that's in the millions of dollars, and, mm -hmm. and you add three or four percent inflation cost every year, it's it's it just snowballs, I and mean, before you know it, it's it's double, it's, or may not double, but it's yeah. a lot more than what you thought it was going to be. Yeah, and then th this will also help us get at least a handle on the prospective budget that we're talking about. Um, another thing that I remember bringing this up to Natalie Clay was the threshold has not changed with that 30,000 or the 1.5 million. A neighboring community of ours, about three years ago now, had put a grouch together and they made it through at that 1.5 million. Three years later, they wouldn't be able to do it, but yet the state hasn't changed that threshold. Mm. And I feel that those thresholds that 1.5 million should be like two or two and a half million now. They should, it, that should be adjusted by inflation, but it it doesn't change. Yeah, it, if I remember correctly, that that count also was able to keep it under by doing some staging of of the project of doing one element one year and then finessing it so that it wasn't all in one budget. Sometimes yeah. you have to <laughs> I was trying to be generous. Yeah. Um, but there may be ways to to skirt that there may not be to to work around some of the requirements to some extent. Again, having someone on board, and whether it's Western Sampton or someone else following up on them, who's, more, think, who's more familiar with the process. Just to put an OPM on is gonna, I gotta believe it's gonna cost us hundred thousand mm -hmm. yeah. per year for that. Can I clarify a couple things? Uh, the one point five million is construction cost. Estimated construction cost. Estimated construction cost and thirty thousand design fee. Thirty thousand design fee for. Or, okay, 30,000 is an extraordinarily small thing. Yeah, very just clarifying that. Okay. Um, this seems to make a lot of sense to me going yeah. ahead with somebody who's going to do a feasibility study. It's essentially us picking a la carte rather yeah. than committing all at once to the entire project, the specific designer, and scoping out, you know, the programming and the feasibility of certain lots and getting some kind of an idea of, a, of cost estimates for various things, uh, architectural and engineering fees, blah, blah, blah. I think that's a great idea. So it might be behind this. OK. And the payment from the building stabilization fund will require a vote of the special town meeting mm -hmm. at okay. some point. So we, need to so we passed it make today, approving the, we can go ahead and engage Weston Sampson but have to get a payment after approval by a special town meeting. And do we need to accumulate a number of things to call a special town meeting? Um, we typically, we typically like to yeah. have a critical mass of them. But not just, right, right. let's get together for one thing. Right. Yeah. Unless, yeah. unless the one thing is very important. And, right. right. But I don't think that this is time critical it's enough. A lot of time it's something that's time critical that sort of takes it. Yeah. Okay. So are we looking for a motion? Then? Yes. I would move that we accept this proposal from Weston and Sampson. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Done. So just to be clear, we will need to appropriate the money before we can sign the agreement. Okay. Okay. Because the law says we the the county needs to appropriate money before we can spend it. Okay. So, so how do we deal with that with from the company who say we're waiting to appropriate the money, but we're probably going to go ahead. Yeah, well, we can reach out and let them know that. Yeah. Okay. We can negotiate something or something. Yeah. 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 Negotiate something or put it, you know, let them put it on their calendar until 
such time as we have approved. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Next, uh, discuss zip code public feedback session held on June 29th. Uh, I was at the meeting. It was very useful, but not as useful as it could have been because there was no post office representative there, which oh. uh, certainly left a lot of questions unanswered because we did they not decide not to show up or were not invited? Or... Oh, they were invited. They just okay. decided not to send anyone. Okay, then. We um, actually, we actually do not have the contact information of the people. Okay. Uh, every, everything had gone through uh, uh, represent uh, Congressman McGovern's office. And there, there was an invitation issue. Yeah, oh, yes, through, yes, yes. Through some channels, it was just yeah. Through channels, the, the, the right. post office uh, is a very large and very impenetrable organization in many ways. And finding the person or people who are responsible for things is not at all easy. Uh, I was there, as I said. I came away with two real takeaways from it. One is that the town is very much divided, whether it's 50, 50, 60, 40. There was mm -hmm. a sort of straw of show of hands that was roughly equally divided in the room. Um, we had done a poll which showed equally divided. So, there's a lot of passion on the subject, but there is certainly no clear consensus mm -hmm. on the subject. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is that I took away from the meeting is that more important, it seemed to most people, rather than the zip code per se, is making sure the Waitley Post Office stays open. Mm -hmm. And that it would not be worth it to make any kind of change if it would result in the closing of the Waitley Post Office. Uh, it's one of the few gathering spots or meeting points that there is in this town. And the Post Office Department is in the habit of closing. We've already lost mail delivery from there. Um, the night of this, meeting, uh, we got an email that from, from a town resident that directed us to a news story that the town of Westbrookville in Sullivan County, New York, roughly the same size town as ours, abruptly had their post office closed one day. It was just open one day and then there was a notice posted, you know, as of tomorrow, this post office is closed and delivery or post office box services will be at the next town, you know, five miles away. And I think the most important thing in this discussion is to avoid, do whatever we can to avoid that. And do we have any power over that? I no. Mean, do we have any idea why post offices are closed by the The post office department is a large impenetrable organization. Right. So it's not like we could do or not do anything that would change that? Or is, um, is there something? I, I worry that we could do something to call attention to ourselves. <laughs> right. That um, I, I don't know that for certain, but I could see something of a deal. You know, if we go and say, okay, we want 01093 to, you know, right. people in right. South Europe, you know, for 01093 for everyone. And they'll say, okay, that sounds good to us. We'll run it all through South Deerfield. We don't want two post offices with 01093 zip codes. Oh, is South Deerfield 01093? So no, no, but one? no, but if if the if the delivery for what is now the South Deerfield part of town oh, okay. continues to run through South Deerfield. Right. But we change the have the zip codes changed to 01093. Right. Now it's going to be there can be two different post offices theoretically with the same zip code. Our post office boxes and the delivery. And I, I Fred, I, I think I think people I think somebody's making that up. That that it doesn't that doesn't matter. 
that they're going to close a post office or not, and it's not going to depend on whether one place covers more than one zip code or no. not. I, 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 I just, we, we, we could make any decision and they could still close the post office. Okay? They, may, yeah, they may be two very separate issues. Absolutely. They're completely they, they, separate they, issues. They, completely they, they, separate. They could, well, they could Don't well intertwine them. They, they likely are separate issues, but there's also a possibility that someone somewhere in the post office department will not consider them separate issues. So there was a woman, I, I watched portions yeah. of the meeting. There was a woman who stood up who I think was from Leverett, who said that they had gone through this and consolidated all of their zip codes. And it was formerly. Formerly. Take a part. Formerly. 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 Oh, right. She, and uh, she lives here. here. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, would be interesting to hear from her a little bit more how uh, did their post office stay open if we yeah. are going to conflate those two things. and. And, uh, you know, how did it go? Tell us more about how it went smoothly. I, I think we need to... Or smoothly. just reach out I, to Leverett. Based on that, I just think we are going to need more information than we currently have. There were a lot, of, a lot of unanswered questions, yeah. especially on the technical side from the post office. Who didn't um, show up. Who didn't show up, right. Um, and, you know, given the... Division in the community. I don't want to. I, I'd rather, for now, stay with the status quo until we get more information mm -hmm. than push through something which may have unintended consequences. Well, first of all, I want to say bravo for having the the meeting anyway. Yeah. Thank you to Amy. Lavelle. Yeah, Amy, Amy, Amy Lavelle Lavelle put it together. Made that happen because that came out of somebody showing up to a select board meeting suggesting it, and to Lynn Sibley for and, conducting yeah, it. For conducting it, so you know we've got we got more information than yeah. we would have had without that, and we may still need more. Yeah. Bravo for everybody who made that happen. But I think for now, based based on that meeting, there's no clear course of action dictated. So let us continue to look at the issue. Is this this is probably not something that would ever like lit literally go on a ballot or be voted on by people in a special town meeting so that we literally could have the citizens? I mean, there could, all, there could always be non-binding. I mean, there could always be non-binding non articles that could, that could come. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess. Go ahead. But yes, good. I. I agree about learning more about what happened in Leverett. Um, did they start out with people being kind of not sure uh, and kind of on two sides? Um, and the, we only talked to one person from Leverett, um, but I, I'm guessing the people at the post office there might have the answers to some of the questions. And um, I probably can't do it from here, but- um, I, to reach out. I, I was gonna say, it, it, it's, if we say, well, let's just look at the issue, let's come up with a couple of concrete steps of things that we can get maybe some more answers and some clarity um, on that. Uh, so like, for example, the one thing they told us was that there would be 12 months worth of forwarding rather than the usual three months from when you normally change your address. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's negotiable, um, but, that certainly would be a question to to ask. I think one of the people who wrote in uh, was thinking along the lines of, "Hey, if that you know if that happens, maybe um, maybe that could be longer. Maybe it could be indefinitely. But I'm, I'm guessing the post office won't want to do it indefinitely. But um, so that's something we'd be asking of the post office, though, not of Leverett. We have other things that we would. Well, want the to ask. post office and Leverett might be a really good font of information. Oh, okay. The, the whoever is running that particular post office, the people on the ground kind of know how how it worked. Um, I don't know. Also, I wonder if um, I I'm guessing if this went through McGovern's office, maybe that's another place to go looking for some more information. We could press them for it. Like, who did you contact in the Postal Service so that we can get more information about how they would implement it? Um, and tell them, hey, we, we're we're having um, a lot of questions about how this would really get implemented. 
Um, so that might be another place to follow up. Those are two that I thought of. I'm guessing Brian will have an even better idea. <laughs> well, the frustrating part for us has been we haven't tried, we haven't gone through Congressman McGovern's office and we've asked for the contact information of people at the USPS and they essentially refused to give it to us. Um, so I'm kicking myself because we did have it. We did have a Zoom meeting and we did talk to people from the USPS, but it totally escapes me what their names were. Um, it wasn't recorded. You can't go find it. Yeah. No, it wasn't. I don't think it was a Zoom meeting that we set up. It was a virtual meeting. I don't know if it was on Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think I think we need to push harder mm -hmm. with the with the USPS and and. and and gets a, a lot of answers to the questions. When, when we did have, when we did have the meeting, um, you know, it was very clear that, and I don't know the the technical aspects of this, but they said that however system they use to code the mail, um, that if it was all one mail, if he, if you're currently serviced through the South Vietnam Post Office and use all one zero nine three after the switch is made, then your mail will continue to go through the South Deerfield Post Office. Mm -hmm. Exactly how they do that, how they barcode or scan things, I don't know. Um, but at some point, I think we need, and this is hard for with the track record of the Postal Service, but we have to accept that that they, if they think they can do it, they can do it, right? Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> um, and the same with with any, you know, any mail that's continued to go to 0093 is not going to be not going to be uh, impacted, but I guess it would. It would also. I wonder if my no captured one, but um, that's what they had told us: is that mail will continue to go to the same post office that it's going to, um, and internally that the process that they have there, they are able to handle it. Yeah. It, it, exactly what machine does what and what technology they use, I don't know, but at some point we got to trust that they're going to that they're able to do it if they say they're going to. But at some point, there's there's that little faith. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, are there questions that you'd like me to ask if I reach out to the Leverett Post Office? The first one that I can think of is how did the transition go in your viewpoint, and were people initially upset about it, and has that changed at all over time? What else? Yeah, would you I think like just get know? a bit historical record of how. You know, how did what, what what did they do when that went? How it went? Yeah. Okay. Um, there was concerns about package delivery service, the UPS and FedEx. Um, okay. Right. There was that concern about right these companies who who claim to not use the U.S. Postal Service zip codes. Um, who actually do? Yeah. Who probably actually do? Yeah. Um, yeah. How would it impact like the them? U.S. P. FedEx drops it off at USPS, who then turns I'll around. I'll do that other so that, that's, that's a separate issue that okay. sometimes USPS is the delivery function for UPS and FedEx. Yeah, right, right. But that, that, that's different from the regular drivers using zip codes yeah. to identify. Yeah. Right. So the question is if I, GPS, am I, oh, let's say Google Maps, right? Mm -hmm. Is it still going to show up as 01373 on my address? But any mail that's sent to me would, would say oh nine three maybe. Right. Oh so my God. are we gonna have this parallel parallel system that's that's out by? Yeah, okay. It um, sounds like you could have a parallel system for about a year, right? Because you've got a year's worth of forwarding to straighten out. Um, yeah. but the I guess since at our town, one of the the person who, who kind of brought this forward, at least to us, was our former uh, town clerk and treasurer and collector. Um, I wonder if folks at the Leverett town office would have something to say about it. And they certainly would have, like we are, he heard from people on both sides. That might be another um, another place for information. Good idea. Okay. Do we know when? When this leverage change was made? No, that's one of my questions. Is when did it? It was like 2000 or something like that. Oh, so it's like Quite 20, 20 years ago? Yeah. So the, the town administrator is still the same, and I believe the town clerk is still the same. Okay. I think they'd be good resources. I actually reached out to them. Oh, thank you. It was out on the Friday. I was writing the story. Can you give me their names? Yeah. Marjorie McGinnis 
Is the administrator? Is that the time is for Marjorie uh, McGinnis? I don't know. Okay. We can hope can that probably people in the post it. office are still the same, but I would count on them. Cool. Thank you. Close Stratford. Okay. Do you want me to reach out to Close Stratford Stratford's office again? You Go for it. Yeah. And I'll reach out to Kevin's office because there has to be some breakdown in this wall <laughs> um, for this to happen. Yeah. yeah, in the postal service in the town. Yeah. Um, I can't say I'm going to be able to do it, but there has to be there has to be some level of transparency here. Yeah, and coming out from behind the shadows. You know, information. Okay. Post office is never good at that. <laughs> we don't need anybody's home phone numbers or home addresses, or I assume everybody has a work email. No, we just need to know who to contact about what because. Just different levels in the post office. Okay. okay. Anything else on this? No. Moving on. Uh, loading on to approve the contract with a solar for installation of solar array with battery storage at the town offices. We have a proposed contract here. Uh, and why, we, why why we you tabled this because the contract was unclear last time? Uh, so we tabled this um, because the contract included several things that, um, well, I didn't like and that were <laughs> illegal in terms of they need to pay for minimum wage. All righty. Um, and there was, I forget what the other one. Oh, the they, they, they didn't, uh, they put the wrong system in. And they the put contract, cost not the one we asked for, right. Right, without the batteries. Um, oh, and they also excluded uh, payment and performance bonds, which we require. Wow. Um, so that's all included in here. It was, I think, it was a matter of going too quickly and just. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Joyce, myself, and Paul Newland had a conversation with them um, last week to just review the changes that I had emailed to them. And, so. and you're satisfied with the changes? You're good with it, Joyce. Yeah. You're good with. Um, I probably didn't read it as closely as Brian did. I mostly was looking for the solar batteries, <laughs> um, but uh, the, and the uh, inverters. Um, they don't specify what kind of inverters, but they did in their proposal already. And the idea here is, uh, is that they're going to do an engineering. They're going to do a detailed engineering study. Of our electrical system and the proposed system to make sure everything, um, everything that they propose will, will, will work. And then at that point, um, let's just say worst case scenario, if it's just not going to work, then we'll either we'll either do change orders to, to make changes to the system as they propose it, or we could just say it's not going to work and mm -hmm. we don't need to go through with the contract. So, um, there is that out, you know, after that engineering phase if we need to. Okay, go. Cool. If you're both happy with this, do you have any other questions? And no. I will we approve the master purchase agreement with a solar or town office solar array. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, next compensatory time arrangement for non exempt salary employees. Brian, yep. So, our personnel policy. So this um, relates to the fire chief decision. Uh, I don't know. They just find the print up that I have with the personnel policy. In the fire chief position under the, the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act, um, the, it is considered a non-exempt employee um, because they don't uh, they don't pass the um, wage test essentially. Uh, they don't make enough to, to, to bring them in the exempt, uh, the exempt committee. So they're not exempt employees, which means that um, the overtime laws apply to them, um, which is employees shall be paid one and a half times the regular, regular hourly rate for the hours worked beyond 40 hours of the work week. Um, so that's what the personnel policy says, but it also says flex time or comp time may be taken in lieu of overtime pay. At the rate of, of time and a half um, by mutual agreement of both the employee and the supervisor prior to the time being worked. 
Um, so the, the the supervisor here is the board is the select board. Um, so it's either that if if the fire chief were to work more than twenty hours, um, we would have we would have to pay him on an hourly rate, and if he worked more than forty, then we'd have to pay him the overtime rate. Um, or um, and I, it, it's it's the the desire of the of the current fire chief to to do the uh, the, the comp time mm -hmm. and, and not to do the time. So um, that would require approval of, of the select board. Um, it's I think it's a little bit more budget friendly in the sense that let's say if you work twenty two hours one week, then it would go to comp time. It would go to comp time, and then you know, if you work eighteen hours. The following week, and then you could use those two to make the 20 to meet the requirement the 20 hour requirement that the select board had set for the for the position. So um is overtime working is working overtime at the discretion of the employee or at the discretion of the town at the requirement um, of the town? So it's Plus it's usually at the request of the department head. Um which is but in the case of <laughs> the department head. I mean, uh, it, it should be at the request. Of, it should be at the. I would think it would be at the, the discretion of the supervisor, um, but that's a little difficult in this situation. If he's working at a fire for, you know, twenty four, he's put in eighteen hours already, and then there's a fire, and then he has to work twelve hours. You know, ten hours at a fire, he's not going to have time to to come to us for permission. Right. Right. Um, okay. Okay. I'm, I'm happy with this if he's willing to go to the comp time rather than yeah, I'd be comfortable with it too. Reimbursement it makes our budgetary life much easier. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, this is sort of just this came up when they were trying to set up yeah. the payroll for fiscal year 24. Um we need to figure out if there was overtime or not. And I don't actually have an agenda. Is this something we're voting on? Um. Yep. Okay. Yeah, would be good. Then okay. I. Jo on. Wait, look, Joyce, do you have any comments on this? Um. No, I think we hired a good person. I don't think this is a system that's going to get abused. Okay. All right. Then I move that we uh, put into effect flex time at one and a half for the fire chief. Second. As outlined in, Home time, right? in, the, yeah. in the paperwork. As outlined in the paperwork. And I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> okay. Uh, new business taken care of. Uh, updates on board members. I have nothing at the moment. Uh, Joyce, have you had any meetings with? Um, no, I've not had any meetings, but I just keep hearing more from our South County Senior Center Director, who's just really awesome and uh, has been applying for grants. You all signed letters to support, and a couple of those came in, and um, uh, she's just freaking awesome. That's <laughs> that's all I have to report. We like that. Uh, okay, I've got one thing. One that I'll step on the town administrator update. Uh, from the SCEMS Board of Oversight, board has appointed Tim Drumgool, who's one of the EMTs, to be the temporary chief, acting chief, I don't know, interim chief, uh, with the departure of the previous chief. Tim. <clears throat> has indicated that he is not interested in taking the position on a permanent basis. So the Board of Oversight will be at the at our next meeting, we'll be discussing the procedure for interviewing and screening uh, for a full-time chief. Uh, the other issue that has come up is a question of compensation for the services in towns that are not in the that are not Deerfield, Waitley, or Sunderland. The scandals 
of the backup service for other towns. Uh, if there are emergencies that need to be covered, they cover, but unfortunately, the roughly 20% of the calls last month were in other towns, and we're going to have to work on figuring out how to get adequate compensation from the towns where we don't have agreements. The largest one for this is Greenfield, and getting money from additional money from Greenfield may be an issue because Greenfield, I know, has tremendous budget issues. Um, they've got a contract with a private ambulance firm, but not they're not part of the SCIMS network, but we provide backup for them. Um, and the compensation that we get for those runs either barely or doesn't cover the cost nor the the lack of the, the need for someone to go out of the station and is not available for calls in the in our area. So that's those are items next on the agenda. Town Ms. Fair, it's Brian. Let's see, covered the first two. Um, so, uh, Joyce was talking about the, uh, the service incentive grants. Uh, the South County Senior Center was awarded two, one for additional um, outreach services in, uh, and the other one was for transportation. Um, let's see, uh, housing production plan will be going will be discussed by the uh, planning board at its meeting tomorrow night um that's been a, a plan that the housing committee has been working on with uh Turcot consultants and then once it is um approved by the planning board it will it will be sent over to the select board for its review and approval and in discussion um and just a reminder uh the retirement celebration for john hannam and others is july 15th um, and that's a ticketed event, so people should reach out to. We still have tickets. Oh, well, I, 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 potentially, we had to submit our numbers, but okay, there may be an extra ticket or something. But okay, no guarantees. No guarantees, but we can reach out to one of those folks. Well, okay. Yep. Um, actually, just um, one other thing. I had included at the end of the select board packet, there was a memo from the Cannabis Control Commission um, in terms of equity guidelines that municipalities are supposed to adopt uh, or that have support, municipality host communities are supposed to have adopted equity guidelines, which to by July 1st, which up to this date, we've received no guidance mm -hmm. on what those equity guidelines should be. Um, in, in backwards typical fashion, um, the state agency is not required to promulgate any regulations related to that until November. Um, so um, at this point, I, I, I'm I'm okay waiting until we see what the what the framework is that comes out of the CCC. Um, but it's, if that's something that, that we want to get working on, it, I'd be happy to start that if the, the board wants to do that. Um, it's been really quiet on the on the, the cannabis front um, in terms of new applications. I it's been dead actually for a long time. Um, I don't know the status. So my understanding is that the two retailers are still trying to open it at the Sugar Loaf shops, um, but um, it's been really quiet. Okay. Uh, one of the one or two other things we're going to look at it. Uh, we have a letter from Amy Lavalley with her resignation from her post as administrative assistant. And fortunately, we have Jessica Murphy approved as new administrative assistant, and Jessica has begun work. Welcome, Jessica. And Sylvie Jensen has begun work as our community development administrator. Mm -hmm. and Thank you for that, and welcome to Sylvia. Any other questions? No. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.